Hello and welcome to Math 250, section 6.3. This is a lesson on orthogonal projections. We're going to begin with the definition. The orthogonal complement of a non-empty subset S of Rn is denoted by S perp, um, that looks like an upside down T as an exponent, is a set of all vectors in Rn that are orthogonal to every other vector in S. That is, S perp consists of every vector in Rn such that on the dot product of um, those vectors in Rn, call them V, with U is zero. Um, some examples of orthogonal complements, um, if S is all of Rn, its orthogonal complement would be the zero vector, because we will always get out a zero dot product, and vice versa, if S is zero, then the orthogonal complement to S would be Rn. Um, let's look at this set. So if I have a set W where um, I have three components, U1, U2, and 0, where U1 and U2 are real numbers, what would be the orthogonal complement of this set? So we want to think about how would we get out a zero dot product if we took any other vector V, call it uh, V1, V2, V3. Um, you know, how would I get out zero from a dot product using this representative vector in W. So we say that um, vector V lies in W perp if and only if um, V1 and V2 both equal zero. Because right now, um, it doesn't matter what V3 is, we will definitely get out zero from that product. But in order to get out a zero dot product overall, I would need to multiply u1 by 0 and u2 by 0 in order to get a sum of 0. So um, that is um, one requirement on it. So if we want to write that out as, um, as a set here, I can write that out as um, 0, 0, v3, where v3 is a real number. And basically, this is um, this is the z-axis. So if I look at it in terms of R3, my x component is 0, my y component is 0. So in the three-dimensional plane, which I'm going to try to draw, uh, I'm starting at 0, 0, but then v3 would be along, you know, would be along the z-axis this way. Whereas here, in the given set, I have an x component and a y component, so I'm flat. You know, I have something here, here, flat. But, um, but I don't have a Z component, so I'm not going up into 3D or down into 3D. So I would always be perpendicular um, no matter what. So that's called an orthogonal complement. Here's just another illustration to show you, um, you know, an orthogonal complement of a two-dimensional subspace W of R3. Um, more generally in this figure, we see a two-dimensional subspace W of R3, which is a plane containing zero. Its orthogonal complement is a line through zero, hence it is perpendicular. So again, when we talk about orthogonal, we're always looking for perpendicular because these have great applications to um, minimizing distance and finding um, closest vectors and, and lines of best fit and things like that. All right, so a um, couple other things. So if, F's, if S is an any non-empty subset of Rn, then the zero vector is an S perp because the zero vector is orthogonal to every vector in S. Multiplying any vector by a zero vector will always give you out zero. Moreover, if two vectors V and W are in S perp, then for every vector U in S, if I find the dot product of the sum of V and W with U using our rules from section 6.1, um, I get out two dot products at each zero, so that also is zero. So we have, um, you know, the zero vector in the set. We have closure under addition. Um, we can repeat a similar argument to show that we are closed under scalar multiplication. So these three things lead us to the great fact that S perp is a subspace of Rn, which leads to an even bigger result, the orthogonal complement of any non-empty subset of Rn is a subspace of Rn. That's a great little tidbit 
for us to use. In addition, for any non-empty subset S of Rn, if we have, it's not if, we have S perp equals span of S perp. In particular, the orthogonal complement of a basis for a subspace is the same as the orthogonal complement of the subspace. And we're going to work out a problem that deals with this right now. So let's consider these two vectors here, um, 2, 1, negative 1, 0, and 3, 4, 2, 2, negative 2. We would like to find a basis for S perp. To find a basis for S perp, we want to keep in mind that a vector V is in S perp if and only if the vector V is orthogonal to both vectors in S. All right, that's a key requirement of maintaining that orthogonality. And that occurs if and only if V is a solution to the system to x1 plus x1, uh, x2 minus x3 equals 0, and 3x1 plus 4x2 plus 2x3 minus 2x4 equals 0. So um, where I got this from was that we're looking for some, you know, vector x1, x2, x3, x4, so that when I find dot products of this vector with each of the other vectors, that the dot product is 0. So in this case, I have 2x1, uh, 1x2, negative 1x3, no x4, the sum of all of that should be zero to get us, you know, what, what it is that we need. So that's why I, I set it up this way. So we can solve this by putting the matrix into, uh, putting the system into an augmented matrix and doing RREF. In the interest of time, I went ahead and I did that. That's this uh, matrix lurking over here. So um, if you go ahead and, um, you know, treat this as an augmented matrix, and find the RREF, and I'll write it out as, um, I'll just call it AB, so that uh, you know it's augmented. This is what I get after I go through the RREF. So once we once we arrive at that, we can then, um, you know, solve this out for X1, X2, X3, X4, and take the, the vectors we get and form a basis out of it. So this first equation, tells me that x1 equals, um, I'll just change the 1.2 to um, 6 over 5, and I'll change this to 2 over 5. You'll see why in a moment. So if I just solve for x1, you know, by moving these guys over to the other side, um, I will have x1 equals 6 fifths x3 minus 2 fifths x4. And then same thing for the second one. Um, I'm going to change the 1.4 to 7.5 and the negative 0.8 to negative 4 fifths. You'll see why in a moment. And again, if I just move everything over, I get x2 equals 7 fifths x3. Sorry, negative 7 fifths x3 because I'm moving it over. Plus 4 fifths x4. And then we know that x3 is equal to itself and x4 is equal to itself. Those are our free variables. So now um, the two vectors that form a basis for, um, for our, uh, for s perp, we can get by just writing out the general solution. So I could say x1, x2, x3, x4 equals, and I'll take my coefficients of x3. So I have 6 fifths, I have negative 7 fifths, I have 1 for the third one, and I have none in the last one. And then for x4, I have negative 2 fifths, 
four fifths. Uh, no, none there, and one here. And finally, um, the reason why I did the fractions is because I, I think I mentioned earlier, we can clear out fractions and maintain orthogonality. So I'm going to multiply each of these vectors by five. So I have no fractions left. So I will have the final answer of six, negative seven, five, and zero. And then for the second group, I have negative two, four, zero, and five. So this would be a basis for S perp. And again, each of these vectors would be orthogonal to the vectors in S. And um, as a basis, they are linearly independent vectors in the set, and they cover um, the orthogonal complement. All right, that was fun. What's next? <laughs> um, so a couple of interesting observations we can make out of this. Um, the orthogonal complement of the row space of A is the null space of A. And we kind of worked on that through this example. We took a row of, um, you know, we took a row from this equation and we found out what, what made it equal zero. So in a sense, we were looking for um, null space. That was the complement. Um, the orthogonal complement of row space. And then um, if, if we use um, A transpose instead of matrix A, um, we find that if we start with null of A transpose, that equals row of A transpose uh, perp, <laughs> uh, two T's back to back. And um, we can switch out row A transpose with column A back from uh, chapter four. So we also find that um, column A perp is equal to um, the null of A transpose. And this visual from uh, figure 6.12 shows um, the null space of A is the complement of the, the orthogonal complement of the row space. And again, that's like what we did here with this calculation going from rows uh, to finding a, a solution to the equation equaling zero. All right, theorem 6.7. Another interesting fact about um, orthogonality in general. So we have this orthogonal decomposition theorem. Let W be a subspace of Rn. Then for any vector u in Rn, there exist unique vectors W in W and Z in W perp, such that u is equal to W plus Z. So basically what we're saying is, we could take any vector in Rn and write it as a sum of two vectors, one in the subspace and one in the orthogonal complement to the subspace. So we're breaking it up into two components. In addition, if V1 through Vk is an orthonormal basis for W, then we have that uh, vector W equals the dot product of U with V1 and then V1 again u with v2, v2, all the way up to u with vk times vk, uh, dot product of vk. And then for any subspace of Rn, another fact that kind of makes sense, the dimension of the subspace plus the dimension of um, the orthogonal complement to the subspace should equal n, should add up to the total dimension. Just to bring back in some of our, our earlier work. So in, in a previous section, we looked at um, orthogonal projections and we, and we developed this idea of distance between the two tips. Um, in a previous section, we called that Z and um, it's back again. So um, as a definition, we're gonna formally call it an orthogonal projection of U on W. It is a unique vector W in W such that u minus w is in w per. So although we went through the steps to calculate it previously, now we're just saying that w lives in w and that u minus w lives in the orthogonal complement, which, which makes sense. We have this vector w living in, in w here, and then the orthogonal complement 
live someplace else. All right. So now we are given that a vector u in Rn and a given orthonormal basis S for subspace W of Rn are both given. So lucky for us, we don't have to do that heavy lifting. It's provided up front. Um, we are going to use S to obtain the unique vectors W in W and Z in uh, W perp such that U is equal to W plus Z. That is our orthogonal decomposition. And then we're going to use our answer to find the distance from U to W. So just looking back to our, um, our previous slides here, by orthogonal decomposition, we are going to use, since we only had two vectors, we're going to use this first part here to determine, um, you know, to determine our vector of interest, W. So I'm going to start by saying that W is equal to, um, let's see here. So we have uh, U, I'll call this uh, V1 and V2. So I have uh, U with V1, and then I will do uh, U with V2. And these are all vectors, so I should just put the bar over them. Okay, so um, this is just a nice little multiplication slash arithmetic problem. If I multiply, vector, I keep saying multiply. If I find the dot product of um, U with, with V1, that means I am multiplying this with this. So I'll keep the one over radical five in front. When I find the dot product of the actual components in the vectors, I have a one, I have a four, and I have a zero. So that just gives me out five. And I'll leave, um, I'll leave the V1 vector there. And then, um, and I think that, yeah, and I forgot the radical five on the bottom. Okay, so that also goes there. Okay, so then for the next one, I have um, vector u, and I'm finding the dot product with uh, this vector over here. So I will leave the uh, radical 14 outside. And then I have uh, one and negative two is negative two, two and one is two. So that zeroes out, negative three and three is negative nine. So um, I got that, and then I multiply that by the original vector. So that's over radical 14, negative two, one, three. All right, lots of stuff going on there. Luckily, it simplifies a bit for us. Um, this is five over five, so that's just gonna be a one. And then down over here, I have um, 9 fourteenths because the two radical 14 just make a 14. And then it just becomes a matter of um, subtraction. So at this point, you can use calculator or get common denominators, whatever you prefer. But our, um, our vector is going to be 1 14 32, 19, negative 27. All right, so that is um, that is our vector w that we were looking to find. That's the first part of the problem. Now for the distance between the two, um, we want to find where are we at here? Uh, we want to find the distance from u to w. Okay, so for the second part. Sometimes the book refers to this as Z, but to keep the, the number of letters down, um, we will simply just find the norm of um, vector U minus vector W. We'll just keep it really simple here. And um, to do that, we simply take um, the one, two, negative three given to us, and we subtract the, the answer that we just found, this uh, 1 14, 32, 19, and negative 27. So once we set that up, um, we then want to 
um, subtract entry by entry. So I'm going to have 1 minus 32 over 14. That is going to be uh, the same as 14 over 14 minus 32 over 14. That is um, negative 18 over 14. For the second one, I have 2 minus 19 over 14. And I can make 2, uh, 28 over 14. And then um, that difference is just 9 over 14. And then, um, oops, forgot the column there. And then for the last one, I have negative 3 plus 27 over 14. So to get uh, common denominators there, I'm going to make this uh, negative 42 over 14 plus 27 over 14. And that's going to be negative 15 over 14. So that's um, what I need to find the norm of. So to do that, then you um, you square root the squares of each of these. And that will give us out a length for all of this. And it simplifies out to three radical 14, sorry, three over 14 times radical 70. So just to summarize, we, we had a vector u and rn. We were given an orthonormal basis for a subspace of w. We obtained um, a vector w so that um, we're rewriting our, um, our vector u as a sum of uh, vector w and z that are in the, um, the subspace. And then we found the distance from u to w.